Are you looking to become a better real estate investor? Then hang on because you're about to experience another episode of the world's most popular real estate podcast, The Bigger Pockets Podcast. But before we get to this week's show, I wanted to invite you to become part of our community, biggerpockets.com, the real estate investing social network. The membership is free and you'll instantly gain access to networking opportunities, educational content, investor tools, and more. Sign up now and get a free copy of our book, The Ultimate Beginner's Guide to Real Estate Investing, read by hundreds of thousands of budding entrepreneurs. Just click this link right here or just head to biggerpockets.com. With that, let's get to the show. This is the Bigger Pockets Podcast, show 55. Take 27. You're listening to Bigger Pockets Radio, simplifying real estate for investors large and small. If you're here looking to learn about real estate investing without all the hype, you're in the right place. Stay tuned and be sure to join the millions of others who have benefited from BiggerPockets.com, your home for real estate investing online. What's going on, everybody? This is Josh Dorkin, host of the Bigger Pockets podcast, here with my co-host, Brandon Turner. Hey, Brandon, you realize this is like our 28th take of this intro? This is, <laughs> I think it was like our 50th take of this intro. That's all oh right. You know, now people know our secrets that we actually suck at this. Uh, maybe that wasn't a secret. <laughs> <laughs> suck. Uh, suck. Anyway, uh, big day today. Big day. It is a big day. You know why it's a big day? Tell it's me. a big day because the Bigger Pockets podcast has reached a pretty cool milestone. One million. One million listens. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. One million. That's a huge so, number. I can't even fathom that number. Okay, I can. It's but. it's amazing, man. I mean, fifty four shows, we we hit a million listens. I I don't know. I'm, I I'm pretty proud. I'm pretty proud of that. I think we've we've uh, brought tons of really good information to people through the show, and and I think the the fifty four preceding shows to this one have have just been of incredible value. So. Uh, thank you to everybody for 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 listening. We we definitely appreciate you guys. Uh, yeah, you, you guys know, rock. Trusted us. Yeah, you do rock. Yeah. And uh, if you think we rock, <laughs> come leave us a, re- a review in iTunes. There you go. Yeah, actually, I wasn't going to tell them that. I oh, was going to say, spread the word. Let other people oh. know about the show. You know, tell other people to come check it out. Biggerpockets.com slash podcast. Put it on your Facebook pages in that little share link. Put in www.http colon slash slash www.biggerpockets.com slash podcast. Share that link with your friends, your family, with everybody. Help educate them in real estate investing. Help us help them. Help us help you. <laughs> nice. Nice. Yeah, you like that? Yeah. You like that? Yeah, Jerry, there you go. Well, Jerry, Jerry Maguire of you. That was me, man. That was me. Show me the money! <laughs> All right. Well, moving on. Yes, moving on. So today we are going to skip our quick tip. And the reason quick we're going to skip our quick tip is we have a couple really, really good ones in this coming show. So uh, pay, pay very close attention. Uh, with that, why don't we just kind of dive in here? So... This, uh, this show is featuring Mr. Jimmy Moncrief, and uh, Jimmy is a real estate investor in the Tennessee area who also has a day job working as a real estate investment underwriter. So basically, Jimmy's the guy ultimately, ultimately responsible for saying yes or no on loans, which is why we wanted to have him on the show today. Uh, what we're going to do, we're going to pull back the curtain for you guys uh, on the lending industry and show you exactly how you can get loans for your real estate deals. Uh, if you don't think it's that big a deal, this is a huge deal. This guy is going to give you insight that you may not have ever gotten before. Um, talking to these underwriters is a rare privilege, so uh, we're, we're especially excited. I know I know, I am. Yeah, me too. This is going to be an awesome show. Yeah, so... Uh, of course, the show notes for today's episode can be found on biggerpockets.com slash show 55. That's show 55. And uh, we invite you to come leave comments or ask questions if you've got them. Jimmy will be participating and will be answering your questions for you. So uh, definitely be sure to ask him on the show notes. Anyway, with that, why don't we get to the show and, and get this thing started? So Jimmy, welcome to the show. Good to have you here. Thanks for having me, guys. Yeah, yeah, we're we're happy to have you on here. Uh, you know, I've always I'm always really uh I always really look forward to your posts every week on the Bigger Pockets blog, and uh, they're always entertaining and uh, informative. So hopefully we can bring out some of that today on the podcast. Sounds good. 
All right. All right. Well, uh, yeah. Josh, you want to ask the first question or do you want me to do it? I, I think I think I could manage, Brandon. Thanks right. for asking. Yeah, I'll be a gentleman. Take it. Do I need permission to scratch my nose too? <laughs> you might. Go ahead. All right, Jimmy. So tell us about how you got started in real estate. All right. Well, let me uh, let me back up. I got started by accident, but I kind of got started in investing when I was uh, twelve. Uh, <laughs> actually, <laughs> wow. So uh, nice. it, yeah, I wasn't uh, good at sports. Uh, so you know, for the international bigger pockets members, uh, that's that's very bad in America. If you're if you're bad at sports, you're uh, you're pretty much just put away, locked in a closet. So uh, I'm raising my hand as well. That was yeah. So uh, when I was 12, I won a stock market competition. So my parents were like, yes, he's good at something. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Nice. So I started. So they strap you to a computer and force you to, <laughs> to figure out the buys and sells. And they're, they're totally rich and retired now, right? Thanks to 12-year-old well, Jimmy. <laughs> This was like pre-computer, uh, showing my age a little bit, but the uh, they did sh- uh, pretty much lock me in a library for the summer <laughs> after that. And then I, um, so what did I do? I want to start my competition. So then I started like reading Warren Buffett books and Peter Lynch books, and that kind of got me into stock investing. And then I got a job at a, a hedge fund after college and became a partner there, but in between, you know, buying my first house and moving, we just, uh, it was so much easier just to rent our house out and then move. So we just tried that. And then, you know, a couple of years later, after analyzing my investments, I, I realized that, you know, my, my, this little rental property that we really didn't think anything about was doing better than, the, you know, my stock market portfolio. So, <laughs> That's when I really started focusing on real estate, yeah. Well, hey, actually, I actually have a yeah. question about that. We, we've yeah. never really talked about this with any guests yet, and that's the idea of, I know we're kind of interrupting in your story, but, you no. know, uh, the we idea of... We would be you, Brandon, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, right. I'm listening and paying attention. I am paying attention. Well, I want to know uh, more about the idea of, you know, you rented out your first house. I mean, you lived in a house, you moved because it was easier to rent it, and then that's how you got started. That's also kind of, I guess, how I got started in a way, and a lot of people do. So uh, maybe we can just, I don't know, touch on that for a minute. Uh, what made you actually think, you know, like this was a good idea? Did you actually look at like the cash flow or was it really just the market's bad, I can't sell? Or, or how did that kind of decision play into that? Yeah, great question. It wasn't, uh, I should come up with a really sophisticated answer, but <laughs> <laughs> like when you were asking that question, I was like, oh man, i I should right now have a very sophisticated answer for him. <laughs> but, uh, it was honestly just like it was. It looked uh, so much easier <laughs> than yep. just rent it and, and then like sell it and have two mortgage payments while you're trying to sell it. And uh, we knew we could rent it out for a couple hundred extra bucks over our mortgage payment. So you know, my wife and I were just like, hey, you know, we didn't have kids at the time, and we were like, you know, worst case scenario, this is an awful experience, and we sell it after the we try the rental thing so yeah. it wasn't a sophisticated analysis like it maybe should have been i don't know <laughs> well i don't even think so like that's fine yeah. hey, you don't know what you don't know when you're starting out but um i i think that's in a really really good way for people to get started with real estate is just turning their own ho- homes into you know property especially you know you can get you can get homeowner loans for a lot cheaper than you can usually get investment loans and the rates are usually better and you can just move and, and keep doing that you know, up to a certain number of, of properties. So it's uh, cool to hear you say that. Uh, cool. All right. Well, uh, anyway, moving on back to your story. So what happened next? Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, so then that worked out okay. And then I, um, so then I got involved and I, I found a multifamily, a triplex that went, uh, that was empty and it was just a, um, great uh investment i thought by the numbers anyway we got it for 80 and we uh all three sides could rent out with for 550 a side at the time and uh so the cash flow was pretty awesome with that so that is what really got me into multifamily where i'm at now but uh Feel free to interrupt if you have any questions. Obviously, but oh, no, do we don't have questions. We're, we're okay. polite. We don't we don't interrupt. <laughs> okay, I'm I'm gonna interrupt. I do have a question. So, okay, uh, eighty thousand five fifty aside. You said five fifty aside. 
Uh, yeah, 550 unit triplex. Okay, yeah, 550 yeah. per unit. So you're bringing in, do my math homework, 1650 a month on an 80,000 investment. That's better than uh, the 2% rule. That's, that's great. That is awesome. Uh, yeah. How did you find that good deal? It was, uh, I, I've had the best luck in not doing anything I'm with the MLS and just finding those uh, like for sale by owner signs that are, this was like a classic, it was some sign stuck in a yard in a street that nobody goes down. <laughs> so, it was nice. like, no, yeah, not the best move if you're the seller, but it was a good move for us because he, I don't know, <laughs> it was a really great area of town, but it was just not a through street. Nobody went down the street, but the three people that lived on it. Yep. And, um, mm. I don't know. So it was, it, that's how I found stuff. Just unfortunately, I don't have a, a systemized like process online, but I've, I found my best deals like that. So, um, was it an MLS deal? Was it listed? No, like I've, and that's my thing. I've only bought one house, the one I'm in now, and it was an MLS, it was very exogenous circumstances, how I got a good deal on my current house I'm living in, but it normally I just don't have, I don't know. It's just a real, a waste of time dealing with the MLS and I'm just speaking of me and I'm probably not doing, you know, I'm sure there's like a hundred thousand realtors listening to this podcast. It was like, well, that's cause you're doing it wrong. And you're probably right. <laughs> <lying. laughs> I'm sure I am. I'm doing everything wrong. I'm sure. So, but yeah, that's nice. just works work for me. Yeah. Well, so Jimmy, first of all, can you please define exogenous, a word I've never heard in my life? <laughs> Just uh, very extraordinary circumstances. So, yeah. Okay. Okay. So, nice. Yeah. All right. No, no, it's good. It's just a word I've never heard. I assume it's, it was something like that. But, you, you know, we're, we're here to learn and I'm learning. Um, so it sounds to me like your, tech, your method, your technique is to go on the map Find every dead end street in <laughs> your in your area, and then basically circle those dead ends once once a week, once every two weeks, hoping that somebody on those streets is doing a fizbo and knowing that no one else is going to ever see that property and grabbing it and getting a great deal. By the way, which if that was what you're doing, it's kind of a good idea, very labor intensive, but <laughs> a very cool strategy. That's that's pretty much it. I mean, I love for serious. Sale. Yeah, I mean, I I love it. Like it, it just uh, because I have a defined area. I'm not driving around the state of Tennessee. You know, look, I have a defined area that I like, and uh, just the side streets, dead end streets, and people just throw like these for sale by owner signs out that get stolen, and <laughs> you know. So most of the time, it's interesting with these for sale by owners. They uh, the seller doesn't think. It's um it's moving fast, but in reality their signs are getting stolen. <laughs> so uh that's really the reason. And now are you the guy who's stealing still signs? <laughs> that's <a real> question. <laughs> no. Come on, Jimmy. Catch up, buddy. This is confession. Yeah. I, I can see that being the, the next big, you know, uh nine ninety seven training course on how to get a good deal. Just go steal all the signs. Yeah. That actually work. Extra cash flow. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Self on Craigslist. Yeah. There you go. There you go. Wow, that's impressive. So, so Jimmy, how did you actually finance that triplex? Then, did you pay all cash for that, or did you get a loan? Okay, great question. And that is, that's exactly uh, this transaction is why I got really interested in real estate finance. Uh, because just for a backstory, at the time I was a partner at a hedge fund. I was a my I was buying it with a business partner and he was an executive at an insurance company. So at the time, like, you know, we both had 800 plus credit scores. We had over a hundred thousand dollars in liquidity. We, uh, you know, made great money. We, no real debt. And, uh, we couldn't get a loan. It was crazy. <laughs> we called like 10 wow. different day. Like I was in charge of getting us financing and he was in charge of like, we were going to fix it up. So he was in charge of dealing with the contractors and, I called him after like the tenth uh, bank. I was like, "Man, we're having a problem. Like, we can't get a loan." He was like, "You can buy the oh. bank." <laughs> he was like, "What are you talking like, about? I'm gonna pay cash for the bank, but I can't get a loan from the bank, right?" Yeah, yeah. I was like, "What are you talking about? We're having trouble getting 
a loan. We don't even need a loan. <laughs> it's like, I know. <laughs> this is like the craziest thing I've ever seen, like, I've ever experienced. So when people complain about bankers and banks, I completely understand. Like, it's crazy. So, so what do you think your, like, maybe mistake or maybe it was just the times or what, what happened? Why was it so bad? Why are we getting turned down? And I know that probably leads us into our next, you know, uh, conversation about what you do nowadays. But I'm just curious, what, what was it that was wrong? Well, I was, uh, yeah, I mean, that's my big platform is like, you know, what I like to like talk about on the bigger pockets blog is, you know, it's just, I was just going about the process the completely wrong way. So this is my big platform. Okay. Brandon is that people go generally investors go about financing and even investing, I would say the exact backwards way, you know, everybody goes and hunts for a deal and they spend all this time analyzing and looking at deals, but they spend very little time looking and figuring out a good financing structure and developing financing contacts and banker contacts. So that's, that's my big platform is, you know, I was just going about the process the completely wrong way. You know, I was, it was during the, you know, this was the fall of 2008, you know, the world is coming to an end. And of course I'm calling all these banks that they don't know me. I don't really know them and I'm asking for a loan. And even though it was just like, you know, 60, 70,000 bucks, it was still like, there was no relationship there. There was no, they didn't know my finances. I don't know. They didn't know my story, my business partner's story. So that's my big platform okay. and uh, what I like to teach people. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. That's great. Yeah, that's really great. So, so you ultimately, I'm guessing you then went and transitioned from this guy who didn't know the banks to somebody who went out and really started to get to know all these guys. And how, how do you do that? I mean, what, what's it about? What do I do when I show up at the bank or, or when I call them and say, Hey, I'm, you know, I'm Josh. I want to, you know, I found this great deal and I, I, you know, I'm doing this professionally now. I'd love to start working with your, your company. What does that conversation look like for the typical person? Yeah. And what, what, is it, what does it look like for somebody like you uh, who's, who's getting them to say, yeah, you know, things are good or Brandon, you know, hey, we want to extend you a new line of credit or, you know, any of the guys who are out there really killing it? Yeah, great question. Um, and let, me, let me take a step back from that. Uh, Josh, here's what you really want to do is treat this like a sales process, okay? Mm -hmm. So instead of, you know, most people come in and just, you know, they already have their tax returns and they're just ready to like, you know, throw up on a banker, you know, with all their tax returns. And instead of doing that, reverse the process and you be the prize, okay? So when you go into a banker's office, don't just tell him your deal and, you know, this is what you want. Reverse the process and you tell him or you interview the banker and you ask them, like, what kind of loans are you looking for? You know, I would reverse the entire process that most people do. And that's like what I like to teach on the Bigger Pockets blog and all kinds of yeah. places. So, so is it essentially you're going from, well, you know, please, please give me a loan to... Listen, we're interviewing a lot of banks. We're looking at various products to see what's your best for us. I'd like to hear from you what you can what you can offer to me. Not oh, please give me money. What can you offer me? Is exactly. that, is that kind of what you're doing? That's exactly it. And I know you guys haven't uh, haven't done your quick tip yet, but uh, <laughs> like right, but right. The, if you're listening to this and you're in your office, uh, I want you, I want your listeners to write this down uh, right now. This is something you can do. If you're listening to this on a Monday, this is something you can do this week that takes less than an hour. That can have a dramatic difference in your real estate investing. Uh, write down two community banks. Okay. And then write down, uh, you know, Preferably uh, this, a small, two s smaller community banks. Then write down two small credit unions and then two maybe regional banks. And so now you've got six contacts. Uh, go on LinkedIn, try to find a commercial banker at those financial institutions and call them and try to meet face to face if you can. And do exactly that. Interview them and ask them, you know, before you just 
you know, present yourself and it's like, hey, I'm Brandon Turner. I'll invest in multifamily properties. Don't tell me, you know, ask them what kind of loans are they looking for. And if they're not looking for multifamily properties to finance, ask, well, who is? And they'll give you referrals. That's a good idea. It's a good tip. I can actually, I mean, kind of testify to that. I think I mentioned a month ago or so here on the podcast about for the first time ever, I had a banker actually call me and wanted to develop a relationship. And I felt totally on the other end of that thing. Like they were trying to get me to come in and I was the prize. Just like you said, for the first time, I'd ever, I never felt like that before. And that was just a fundamental shift in the way that I think in, in terms of before it was always I was begging for things and I needed things. Granted, I still need things, but it became a kind of a cool fundamental shift that I encourage people to do as well. Start thinking your, of yourself as as the prize. So very cool. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think there's a, a d- definitive distinction there, you know, in, in just the thought process. I mean, bottom line is you're not begging. You're not saying, Hey, you know, come on, you know, this is a great deal. And they're like, well, no, no, it's not that great a deal. It's not about the deal anymore. It's about, you know, I, you know, I say the same thing when it comes to, to property management. Most people, you know, especially when they start, will go and they'll start, um, they'll meet a property manager and they're kind of trying to sell their property to the property manager. And that's, you can't do that. It's the <laughs> yeah. total opposite. It's yeah. you're interviewing them. They yeah. work for you and you have to understand that. And, and the same thing I think goes with the banker. They work for you. I mean, in, in, in many ways, you know, yeah. and if you can shift the thinking to they work for me, they're providing my loan. I'm granted, I'm servicing it. I'm paying it. I'm taking care of, you know, via, via this property, you know, suddenly you're in a whole different ballgame. You're, you're no longer like, Oh, you know, I'm desperate for money. Now it's, you're competing against four five, seven other companies who have the potential to get in on this opportunity. Absolutely. Yeah. It's all about, if you can take one thing away from this podcast, I mean, I would say that would be it is reverse the podcast with whoever you're getting a loan from. Uh, you know, because in reality, there's, you know, lending money is a commodity, you know, I mean, it's so it's you should work that to your advantage. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Hey, hey, let's talk about real quick. What do you because a lot of this hinges on what you do for a living now, what your career is, what, what exactly do you do? And can you kind of tell us about that? Okay, great question. So I'm a bank credit officer. So I'm uh, you know, when you're like, you go in and like you were saying, uh, I guess a loan officer took you out to lunch or something, Brandon, you know, and that's like the sales guy and he's wanting to, you know, close loans. I'm the opposite of that. I'm the guy who says yes or no. So I'm like, you know, when they're like, oh, I want to do your deal, Brandon, but the underwriter says no, you know, I'm like the bad guy, you know, <laughs> that, that they blame. So I'm the guy that, yeah, like the risk management. I hate guy. that guy. I know. Yeah. Yeah. Everybody, hate, everybody hates that guy, Brandon. Except for yeah. when he says yes, then everyone loves that guy. Yeah, it's yeah, but, yeah. but they don't really love him because he may say no the next time. So right, you know. that's yeah, the that's, reason they keep uh, keep you hidden. Like you never meet the underwriter, right? You just always just say, "Oh, in underwriting," and it's never like, "Oh, Jimmy said no." It's always just like, "Oh, the underwriter said no." So <laughs> <laughs> otherwise, they come to your house and uh, exactly, yeah. exactly. He's a yeah. little guy they hide in the back closet. <laughs> so being yeah. So like being an under so being an underwriter and a real estate investor is like being an IRS agent and doing your taxes at the same time. It's a little weird. <laughs> nice. Yep, yep, yep. That makes sense. Oh, that's great. That's great. So so then what is it, you know, other than what we just talked about, as as the underwriter, I mean this this is a pretty unique opportunity for, for us and for the listeners to kind of learn a little bit more on the inside. What is it that you're looking for? You know, as an underwriter I come, um, you know, we already talked to your bank. Your bank wants my business. Your bank being everybody but you so far, the little nasty, angry guy in the back room. Um, <laughs> what, what, what do you want? What are you looking great, for? Yeah, great question, Josh. And um, so all banks have credit policies. So before I put anybody to sleep, I'm not going to, you know, talk like numbers and uh, exact credit policies. But I'll, I will talk about like, all underwriting, whether it's with a community bank, credit union, I've been a you know underwriter at a Fortune 500 company, and um, but even a hard money lender, we all have a uh, a five C foundation uh, framework, which all lending pretty much goes through. So I'll talk about that if uh, yeah. if you want me to the five yeah, C's. Yeah, definitely. Okay. 
So if, again, if your listeners are like at an office, you know, write it, you know, it might behoove of you to write this down. Okay, so the five C's are character, capacity, capital, conditions, and collateral. Okay, so uh, the first one, character, that kind of goes back to what we were talking about before about relationships and just, you know, developing that, uh, you know, relationship with your banker. What kind of, you know, character, reputation do you have in the community? You know, you obviously don't want to uh, do make a loan to a convict or whatever. So that's that's that. That's pretty Dang straight. It, Josh, you're out. Yeah. <laughs> All right. He's giving me the stink eye into the camera. Anyway. <laughs> All, All right. right. Speaking of convicts, by the way, just to interrupt, so my my next door neighbor's house was broken into last night, and I'm like, God, man, what's wrong with people? Hey, Jimmy, I think I know who broke into his house. Oh man. Yeah. Oh, Josh, shut up. Looking for some new clothes or something. Oh God. All, All right. right. Back, back to geez. character. Yeah, back to character. Sorry, I had to digress there, Jimmy. Well, into- Speaking of character, obviously, I need to find a co-host with better character. <laughs> Ouch. Anyway, so, uh, okay. So anyway, cover- all right, character. Let's get back yeah. to character. All right, character. So we've got character covered. Okay, uh, capacity is the next one. So this is where a lo- the analytics really come in. So your capacity as a borrower, it's basically like, you know, my name is Jimmy Moncrief. I'm the borrower. How much debt can I personally handle? Or, you know, my company is called, let's say, Moncrief Incorporated. How much debt can Moncrief Incorporated with a personal guarantee, you know, how much can that cover? How much debt service can he cover? What's his liquidity situation like? So that's really where the analytics come into play. Okay. So the next one is capital. And again, that's a very analytical C on, you know, how well capitalized are you? Um, how much money have you personally invested in the business? What's your balance sheet looking like? Things like that. Uh, conditions is another C. And that's basically, you know, that was, you know, in the fall of 2008, I bought this multifamily property. It was like, obviously, it was a horrible economic conditions, you know, but, uh, you know, now it's not a good time. Banks look at, uh, land, you know, raw land is very bad. You know, it's a bad time to buy land, I guess. So, uh, you know, to kind of look at that and, uh, I know, and you guys have been talking a lot about distressed areas. You know, I know that's a hot subject in the forums, uh, like Detroit, right? So honestly, the conditions in Detroit aren't great. Uh, so you have to just take that into effect when you're underwriting, uh, and the last one's collateral. And hey, Jimmy, really quick. Yeah. Jimmy? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Can you not bash on Detroit, please? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not bashing anything. Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah, we don't ever bash not, Detroit that's, that's, on the show. No, we love Detroit, right? Yeah, whatever. All right. <laughs> so, anyway. Uh, can we, all right, back to it. <laughs> all right. So, uh, so the, the last C is collateral. And that's, that's the hot topic. Uh, that's what a lot of, uh, the vast majority of people that, you know, uh, like email me, uh, on my blog or whatever, or ask me in the forums or like, how do I get around this 80% LTV rule, you know, on the collateral and things like that. So, you know, they, and that's why appraisals are required and things like that, but they want to look at, you know, the, obviously the appraised value and just however else they can get a good collateral value for your lending capacity. So, all right, so the five C's are character, capacity, capital, conditions, and collateral. Uh, I actually would love if we can just dive into each one of those just a little bit more. Absolutely. Would, would my assumption be correct that you would say if a person can master all five of these, then a loan would be no problem? I mean, is that kind of the, the ideal? That's absolutely correct, yes. All right, so that's what I was thinking. If, if we talk about each one of these in a little bit more detail, like yeah. how can a person improve each one of these? So we'll just start at the top. Well, let's do, yeah. Uh, yeah, character. It's a great idea. Thanks. Well, you could stop being such a. <laughs> Thanks. How do I improve my character, Jimmy? I mean, like, uh, I'm going to show up to the bank as as it as it regards to the bank, of course. <laughs> yeah. Okay, let's not just say, Brandon. Yeah, I, don't know. I think you might have been. You're, you're gone too far. I think it might be. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm gone. But it, it wouldn't yeah. be hard. A step a step up wouldn't be difficult. <laughs> right. Be answer. Thank, but for the you. other for the rest of the bigger pockets listeners. Yes, thank you. <laughs> well, what you can do uh, character wise, several things. Uh, one, 
you want to be, uh, well, the, the best thing you can do from a lending perspective is, lending perspective is just get not just to walk into a blank a bank not knowing anybody but just get referrals so from you know for me i'm even for me i mean i'm a banker but when i go to the ria every time i go to a um i'm actually organizing a bigger pockets meetup and we've met uh a little bit here in chattanooga and we talk about that every meeting we talk about who are, who are you guys getting a loan from? You know, <laughs> like who's lending? How's that going? And in turn, they not only just tell me who, what banker they're dealing with, but I will ask them, I go, you know, my friend Thomas, who I met on Bigger Pockets, I was like, hey, can you let John Smith at, at ABC Bank, let him know I'm going to call and, you know, just like to talk. And because he gives that referral. My character is already in good, in a better standing than if I was just a cold call, you know, John Smith at ABC Bank. That is such a good tip. That's uh, such a good tip because, and I don't think a lot of people do that, right? Like we, I get together with other landlords and we talk about, you know, I don't know, our latest land, uh, landlording story or horror tenant story <laughs> yeah. or whatever. Or I'll yeah. share like my maintenance guy, you know, hey, you should use this guy. But I don't think I've ever asked one of my landlord friends, you know, hey, who are you getting your loans from these days? Who can you introduce me to? That is an excellent idea. Yeah. Well, now, now my thought on that is this, and, and I'm curious if you've run across this. My thought is, A, a lot of people are going to be stingy about that. Like, oh, I'm not going to share that. You know, you, there's only so much money and you're not going to get, you know, they talk like that too, by the way, when they do it. <laughs> <laughs> no, but, but, you know, it's, you know, the the whole idea, even a bigger pockets, say, like I'm going to digress for a second. Like when I first started bigger pockets, a lot of people were like, well, why would I go on the site and help other people in my area? Like, why would I, why, why would I provide my secrets? You know, well, there's no secrets, but, but, you know, I think people still have that mentality. So my question is, you know, has that been something you've run across? And, and if so, how do you kind of get around it? Man, it's uh, that's an interesting uh, <laughs> that's an interesting issue. I've never ran into that, uh, especially all the people I've met on Bigger Pockets locally here in Chattanooga. That you know, that's never been an issue. It's we're always uh, helping each other out. Yeah, and it's um, what I will say, and I know that it's uh, we don't have enough time on this podcast or ever to talk about complaints about banks, but uh, <laughs> but one. <laughs> One big complaint is, that I see that's false is, you know, all banks aren't lending, okay? Well, obviously, that's like, you know, that's just like saying I own rental property and I don't rent anymore, you know what I mean? I'll just yep. like to keep my houses empty. Like, <laughs> it, what, yeah. what that really is, is like, you know, banks aren't making like that type of loan. So like in my situation in the fall of 08, they weren't making multifamily property loans across a ton of banks weren't making that type of loan so that's so when you hear that a complaint from somebody like oh i love my banker but they don't make hotel loans well ask that's and that's again going back previously in the podcast is why it's important to go interview banks and go interview bankers to see what type of loans they're looking for so you don't waste your time yeah yeah, yeah. that that Good makes advice. a ton of sense yeah well, very yeah. cool all right, uh, next one. So we talked about character a little bit and uh, improving that capacity. Let's, let's talk a little bit more about that. How, do, how does somebody improve their capacity? Okay, so this is really driven uh, a lot by your history, your borrowing history. So this is, I hate credit scores. Um, you know, I, I'll have a big tangent on credit scores. I can... <laughs> I can go off on that tangent if you guys want me to, but, uh, but yeah, wait. sure. Okay. <laughs> so, well, well, I mean, and the reason I say yes is this, yeah. I mean, you've got a unique perspective as somebody, again, you know, it's rare that we get to talk to somebody in your position, in your shoes. And, and I think for me, I'm fascinated. You know, I, I know a credit score isn't, you know, uh, it's just a number, right? It's an algorithm. Yeah. Exactly right. The credit score was, developed for like the lowest common denominator on in lending right like when you go in and you ask like the whoever's at the teller line like can i get a loan and she's like you know what's your credit score and it's like oh it's below 800 no you can't get a loan it's like the a credit score doesn't give 
any value to your liquidity, to your income, to your, you know, I have seen the craziest circumstances. I've seen people with $8 million of cash, no personal debt, and a 480 credit score. You know, I've seen the craziest of circumstances um, that, uh, you know, but mortgage people just, they just rely on them as like a foundational element of their underwriting. But uh, I'm a commercial underwriter and, uh, and so I just think it, they're ridiculous because, you know, I've seen just last week I saw where somebody paid off a million dollar line of credit and their credit score went down. So their cash was up. Uh, their cash last year was around 50,000. Their cash position now is around 300,000. And they paid off a million dollar line of credits. They have less debt and their credit score went down about a hundred points. So, I mean, it's like, <laughs> it's ridiculous, you know, to rely on a credit score. So that's another, uh, uh, quick tip as you guys like to call it quick like, tip. so when you got <laughs> like so write this down if you're listening to this in an office if you you know if somebody turns you down for a loan for a credit score just add just don't just hang up and get mad i know that's easy to do but at here's the question to ask specifically what in the credit score did, concerned you okay so then that forces the issue of they actually have to read the credit score and figure out what's going on. Because a lot of times it's, uh, uh, well, okay, I saw this three weeks ago. Some, uh, they, this guy had a low credit score because he had a maxed out line of credit on his HELOC. His HELOC was maxed out. Well, he didn't have a first mortgage and it was like a million dollar property and his HELOC was 300 grand so the credit score is saying oh this guy's maxed out it's like no that's not the case at all he got a three percent HELOC and of course you know that's a good deal so yeah. you know um so ask specifically what concerns them about their credit score and a lot of times that's uh that will open up the conversation to where it's a fixable problem yeah that's yeah. great advice i'm glad you went on the tangent man that's really really good advice okay great so so that's capacity. A lot of that deals with, um, like I said, your borrowing history. And unfortunately, uh, man, like those annual fees on credit cards and all that stuff, like, I mean, that'll just tear you up. So just, you know, get, you know, whatever, you know, try to get that fixed up and get a free credit report if you can. Um, it also, like, you really want to, um, that's where the ratios depend on, like, your liquidity ratios, you know, and you really want to have, um, you know, a fair amount of cash. So when we were getting that loan for the triplex, you know, it was like they did the analysis of how, you know, how long can I go with this triplex being completely empty before, you know, stress starts to happen. So you want to position yourselves for, uh, for more, you know, capacity for your debt. Yeah. Well, what gotcha. about then? That's great. Let, let's say I wanted to go out and buy an apartment complex. Let's just say, or yeah. I mean, like a large one. Let's say, you know, a hundred units, maybe, you know, five, $10 million. There's no possible way that me as a single borrower could ever pay that mortgage, right? I mean, like, yeah. there's no way I will personally ever have the capacity to do it. So, how much does that play a role into things, into the property itself being able to hold the capacity versus me personally holding it where does that it's a great question thank you awesome yeah awesome question brandon and that's the uh, very ironic thing uh i know in the pre well i don't know when this podcast is getting scheduled but who who is the previous the mackleroy yeah ken mackleroy ken okay yep. like he man i he has this quote and i will be misquoting this but it was it was something to the effect of like the why he focuses strictly on bigger developments it's like the it takes the same amount of time and it's more money yep. <laughs> so yeah. uh, i have been thinking that too because it's very ironically it's it's almost easier to get a bigger loan like that than it is a smaller one because it, that's exactly right brandon you're not on any kind of five, ten million dollar loan, like like a big hundred plus unit apart, the lender already knows. There's no, I mean, there's honestly no point in you being a gear. I mean, you're going to be a guarantor on the loan if it's you know with a bank usually, but it's not. It's not going to constrict you to not getting that loan. Yeah. So uh, yeah, this is a great question though. Thanks. Hey Jimmy, let me follow up on that. Uh, yeah. So. 
I mean, are you saying, uh, you know, the average guy, you know, say, take an average middle class person making, I don't know, you know, family making six plus figures. They've, you know, got a couple of rental properties. Things are going well. Could, could one of those people then essentially go out, find a deal, you know, on, on, a, on a bank like, uh, on a, uh, a big multifamily like Brandon suggested, a hundred unit at 10 million bucks, say, and, and essentially present that to you and say, listen, I know the guy who's selling it. We've talked to him. Here are the numbers. It looks like a good deal. You know, would you guys consider, I mean, would you consider that average Joe, given all the other C's, you know, if everybody's kind of strict, you know, pretty much on the up and up, but nothing spectacular beyond just the deal itself. Yeah. So if the, you know, where, where would that come into play? And because it seems like that really has to be the most important factor, um, given everything else. Great question, Josh. Uh, and look, look, full disclosure, I, at the bank I was at before, it was a top 10 bank and I made 10, $20 million loans all the time. And I don't, at the bank I'm at now, I don't. Our max legal lending limit is 3 million. But uh, one of my neighbors is a, he's head of multifamily lending at Wells Fargo and his minimum loan amount is 5 million. So we actually just talked about this a couple months ago. And so I'll just tell you what he told me. And that was his deals are evaluated strictly on the deal. Um, however, from an underwriting perspective, what's what's important for the personal guarantee is obviously you can't be in financial stress, okay, personally. Sure. Uh, that's one. But two, maybe even more importantly, is your experience in that so I, like me i've never owned a hotel in my life you know so it's like if i wanted a 20 million dollar one for a hotel that that probably wouldn't be approved and i was going to run it you know that probably wouldn't be approved because i don't know anything about the hotel industry so a lot of what he does is helps you know if like brandon is that uh is actually a good example because you've got some experience in multifamily is people that continue to do well in multifamily and just scale up, then they will, because you've got that experience in multifamily and you're just operating, want to operate on a larger scale, then it's really that operational experience that matters more than the financial. Gotcha. Yeah. And, and that's actually a good reason why yeah, people often say, should I start... Should I start with a large multifamily or start with a small one? And it, we asked that question to Ken McElroy on... Uh, on show fifty two, I think it was, and he's, somewhere in there, yeah. Yeah, and he said uh, he actually thinks you should start with a single family. And I, I was actually surprised and kind of taken aback when he said that because you know a guy who does only apartment buildings—that's all he does. Why he would recommend that? But I think that's exactly why you start with one house, and you go with another house, and maybe a duplex, then a fourplex, and you get a twenty-unit apartment. And by that time, each each step adds to that uh, capacity aspect we're talking about and uh, the reputation. And then if I were to go in right now and try to go get a 100-unit you know, apartment complex, I probably would have a lot easier time than most people because I've got that built-up reputation. Yeah. So, have you ever looked at a, a HUD loan, Brandon? A I have, large? Not a large one, no. And I'm actually curious about that. Do you know anything about that? Well, uh, I don't, but going back to my neighbor, <laughs> it's very <laughs> interesting because it's, uh, he, he, does, again, he's head of multifamily for Wells Fargo in this area, in this region. And he, he came from California and these HUD loans, he said, it's like a pregnancy. It's like, it sounds, it's fun in the beginning. It's not so, and it's painful. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but, uh, he, you know, doing loans, these $5 million loans, so these are 100 plus unit, you know, apartments that he's doing, and uh, three, he's doing 35 year AMs at three and a half percent interest rates, you know, with wow. five with five five percent down, it's like, wow. how wow. can you make money at that, so, and, that's like that's crazy, yeah, yeah, but again, now it takes about not, it's not easy. It's a lot of paperwork, a lot of government, you know, all, like all, it's not easy to get them, but you know, what, what is easy, right? Yeah. <laughs> and it, yeah. and it takes nine yeah. months, but if you can get that type of financing structure, a 35 year AM, yeah. of, it, I mean, and it's government guaranteed mortgage. I mean, a, I mean, it's, that's a good one. I mean, that's a good structure. Wow. Yeah. yeah. That's wow. awesome. 
I was actually just talking with Ben Labovich about that the other day, how he mentioned he wanted to buy like a large property. And I said, well, we need a loan. He's like, oh, a HUD loan. And like, I had never even really considered that before. I, you know, you hear about HUD for, you know, the small three and a half percent down single family homes or, you know, small multifamilies. But there is a whole world out there of, of uh, FHA or whatever loans for these large properties. So, you know, someday we'll have to actually talk to a, you know, a, a major, uh, you know, apartment guy that uses them. That'd be really a fascinating show. So yeah, it would be, if, if there's somebody who's listening who actually uses these HUD loans, we'd, yeah, we'd love to talk to you. Yeah, hit us up for sure. Cool. All right, moving on to the next one. We talked about character and capacity. Let's talk about capital. And that was, if I remember right, my memory's terrible, but that's like how much money you have, right? I mean, essentially. Yeah, and... uh you know, what they want to see is, especially with, you know, as I said before, I'm a commercial underwriter. So they want to, you know, what I want to see is, are we on the same side of this? You know, are, is the bank a true stakeholder in your company? You know, are we both positioned for benefit? Are, are you at risk in this as well as I am? Right. So, uh, you know, have you put money into this company and left it? How What's the equity position like of your balance sheet? What is, you know, what you don't want to see is a company that's just every year it's in the overdraft and it's draining, you know, the owner drains the cash out of the company and, um, you know, and there's nothing left and it's just a, a very weak balance sheet. So that's, that's real, very balance sheet driven, uh, issue right there. Okay. Gotcha. Now, gotcha. And obviously to improve that, you, you draw less of the money out of the yeah. company, you leave cash in there and you, to make smart uh, decisions for your company, not just yourself. Yeah, and that's the uh, you know the eighty percent LTV. I mean, that's a regulatory driven number, but you know there's all kinds of ratios in there. If like let's say you get a loan on some equipment and it's a seventy percent LTV, I mean all that's regulatory driven and credit policy driven, but it's really look at what's behind the scenes of like you know the banks are just wanting to see make sure that y'all are on the same page and both of you guys are at risk, you know? So that's what you're looking for. Yeah. Well, nice. so what about specifics? How much money? Uh, I, I, I know that you can't really answer this directly, but let's just say I'm looking to refinance a half a million dollar apartment complex, you know, a small apartment. How much can just I, hypothetically, hypothetically, right? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> hypothetically, of course, if I yeah. needed to refinance my apartment complex, do I need a hundred grand in the bank? Do I need 500 grand or do I need a thousand dollars? I mean, what, what would you feel comfortable as an underwriter seeing? You know, the, well, the cash in the bank isn't that, uh, that important as the appraisal of the, of the property and to making sure like, you know, I would be happy to give you a four hundred thousand dollar loan. Yep. Uh, it, you know, it, and let's say you you don't have you know because you've invested in some uh, refurnishing and you know maybe your cash position's a little low. I mean, that's fine to even do a cash out refinance and maybe pull it up to eighty five percent LTV. So that's not as important as just making sure the the appraised value of the the apartment complex is fine. Okay, and yeah. and I do. I mean, yeah. I am self serving in that because I do need to refinance my apartment. And uh, I've been talking with this local bank, which to bring us back to earlier, I was talking to the guy who refinanced my personal house and then he's refinancing two of my like small multifamilies. And I mentioned to him one day I got an apartment I needed to do. So he said, Hey, let me introduce you to our lead commercial and, uh, you know, lender yeah. in, in the company. So he, we're the three of us are sitting down for like coffee next week sometime or the week after when I get back from vacation. And, uh, we're going to talk about that. And that's exactly what. Uh, you're talking about there introducing and, and relationships. It's perfect. Yep. Nice. Okay. Let me, uh, and uh, I'll, we'll get back to the season, but I want to tell you two things, Brandon. Yeah. Okay. Uh, one, try to, uh, try to find another bank of that size. Okay. That's a direct competitor to that bank. That's, that's courting you right now for a loan. Ooh, okay. Ta- and then ask to speak with their commercial banker and tell them the situation and get a rough approximate for range. Okay, and so then when you go back, and then there's a way to do it very artfully. So you don't, what you don't want is to make both parties mad and not want to deal with you, <laughs> obviously. Yeah. But there's a skillful way to be like, I just did this actually. I just got a an unsecured line of credit, and I said, uh, and 
you know, it, it took a little while. And I said, are you, are we still good? Cause this other bank is, is they're asking for my business as well. And I can just go there if, if that'd be easier for you guys. And they were, Oh no, 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 no. Do you need, do you need a <laughs> like, what do you need? What do you need? You know? Nice. So they, so, okay. So that's the first thing to do. Um, and the second thing I was going to mention, and this isn't necessarily uh, for you, but like before when I talked about how I called 10 banks and I couldn't get a loan and I was just doing everything the wrong way. Uh, you know, that, uh, what people do, like when that happens a lot, when people call around and they get a contract, let's like, a duplex and, uh, and this happens a lot with duplexes and triplexes is they'll call and they'll get a hold of somebody that works in the front line and, and they'll be like, Oh, we don't make those type of loans. And then they'll just hang up. You know, yeah. Like, well, that's not true at all. Like your bank makes those type of loans. You're just talking to the wrong person. So yeah. Ask to speak with the small business banker or the commercial banker, you know, something of that effect. Uh, and even, uh, it, it's very interesting, if you're dealing with a big mega bank, don't ask to speak with the commercial real estate department because they just deal with like the mega type. If you're a full-time professional, the Ken McElroy's of the world, right? And yeah. the, the big publicly traded, you know, they just deal with that. So don't call and act like, you're, you know, you're the man and you're about to go public next year. But, you know, if you're just needing a loan on a duplex, ask to speak with a small business banker or like a commercial banker. So those are That's just awesome. Two, yeah. All right. So we, we talked about character capacity, uh, capital, and uh, why, why don't we jump into conditions here? So can you, okay. can you expound upon uh, yeah. conditions a little bit more so we can kind of get a deeper look? Conditions is what you have the least control over and that's just like your general economic climate. But here's the important thing to remember when you're uh, writing a letter or putting together a presentation for your lender, which I, uh, I, I think is a great thing <laughs> if you're uh, serious about developing a lending relationship. So the conditions. Okay. So I think um, what the lender wants to see is they are lending on a productive asset. Okay, so that's that's the important thing. So, uh, you know, the current condition. That's why, like, you have a tough time getting loans in the in the war zone of your, you know, Detroit or whatever. It's because the conditions are bad, right? It's why you have a tough time getting a loan on raw land. It's because it's an unproductive asset. You know, it's not producing. You know, it's, so that's what the bank wants to see. Is it's are you improving the this asset? It's it's a good asset. Yeah, gotcha. Okay. All right. Okay, so is there is there anything beyond just the simple improvement of the asset? I mean, ultimately, it sounds like this is the one that's mostly out of your hands. Um, it, it really is, and it really, okay. uh, you know, conditions is, uh, it's more, again, this is all lending. It doesn't, it's not just real estate, but what they want to see, well, let's, let's say this is, uh, you've got some bigger pocket listeners that own some high-end hotels, so they're, very sensitive economically to the economic downturn, you know, because it's, it's very, uh, cyclical. Uh, so, uh, so that's yeah. what, you know, okay. So that's conditions. All right. Yeah. So conditions are pretty much out of your hands, but let's jump into collateral and maybe how we can improve that. All right. Great. And collateral is maybe the most important, um, so that's cash flow, of course, service and the loan, because uh, with, you know, banks, and I'm just speaking for banks here, you know, they want to have cash flow paying back the loan, obviously. So that's what you need to show your lenders. But your collateral, you know, they want to make sure it's good collateral, but they also want to make sure that it's enough to, you know, if the loan goes bad, that, you know, they'll have enough collateral in a stressful situation to liquidate that collateral. But here's a, a tip that your listeners can utilize if, um, because this happens a lot, you know, people get turned down because their appraisal is bad, right? I mean, that, that happens all the time and uh, it's happened to me, right? But here's what you can do is if you have like an investment account somewhere or something else you can pledge like or let's say a bit maybe a better example is if you want a line of credit because a lot of people want lines of credit and um you know unsecured lines of credit are really hard to get is pledge an investment account or some other kind of collateral like maybe if you have a car paid off or whatever so you can pledge that as collateral 
So uh, for your line of credit or for any kind of loan that you want approved, if you get a bad appraisal or something like that happens. Jimmy, I got a question. Yeah. Sounds kind of like what uh, Brandon does is at the poker table. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, I mean, isn't that what that is? Isn't that like, hey, we're all playing poker and he's run out of cash, so he throws his car keys down? I mean, isn't that what it is? I mean, I almost <laughs> took his car a couple times. You got it. <laughs> You got it. it is, but it works. I mean, what do they call <laughs> yeah. it? Like cross collateralization or whatever. Yep. That's yeah. it. Yep, that's it. I mean, obviously yeah. that increases so, so the risk you... quite a bit, quite a bit. Cause yeah, yeah. you and, lose it all. You, you lose it all. Yep. But, and, uh, another, another problem, another problem from, from the, uh, Lindy perspective, if something gets cross collateralized is it's very hard. Like you were talking about refinancing your apartments, Brandon. Yeah. It's, it, like, let's say you're, you know, to get this awesome rate, you got to pledge this other little single family home that you're in free and clear, and you, you just cross collateralize them, no big deal. Well, it's a really big deal if, if you want to sell or refinance again because you can't split up those assets. Uh, yeah. uh, or, or if there's usually a big, you can, but there, I mean, you always can do, you know, you can do anything, but there's going to be a big fee involved. There's, it's like a big headache. A lot of lenders don't want to deal with it, you know, so uh, there might be a prepayment penalty. So that's another issue. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. What do you, what do you recommend? Sense. Sorry. Uh, I, I was going to say, what do you recommend what, um, when it comes to cross collateralizing? You know, obviously, we're, we're not going to throw down your your big uh, fuzzy dice or your diamond ring. I mean, you know, we're, we're talking about something more substantial. You know, is it typically a smaller rental property or or, or something like that? Honestly, it, it depends on on the situation. But what I I personally am I'm looking to do uh, this year is to. Um, utilize my I have a look like a small little investment account with you know stocks and stuff and just to pledge that because here's the thing and I like you know uh, I know the previous guest talked a lot about you know having like a, an investment account for diversification but if those stocks in that bond portfolio you know is throwing off you know a dividend yield or something around five percent and you get a lot of credit around that same range, I mean, it's it's almost like a zero percent loan, right? Yes. Okay, so like you're not. I mean, and the, the if it stocks, hopefully, it, you know, I know they crash and burn sometimes, but hopefully, <laughs> they they in the long term they go up a little bit. So right. you know, you're not here. Here's and this is all driven by a mistake I made. It's just like I've I've made like every mistake in the book probably you know <laughs> and so like you know the first first house we bought you know i like sold off all my stocks even in my uh like some iras i had right and i paid all these fees and penalties well now i know that you don't have to do that all you have to do is pledge those and use that you like you don't even have to sell them you just pledge that so the lender is in a good position collateral wise to make you a loan yeah that's that, great that's that great. answer your question josh yeah, yeah, it does. It does. Well, so, so I'm I'm going to kind of take it, I guess, one step past um, the, the collateral. I I, th I think we pretty much covered that, and I I think um, I think these five C's are, are are fantastic. I know Brandon and I didn't intend on having this entire show surround the five C's, but I I think I mean I think this is you know superb information, and. I, and I'm sure very few investors know about all this, especially the newer guys. So thank you. But um, really quickly, how important are financial statements, business plans? Uh, do, do underwriters care? Do, do those come into play or are they just kind of tools for supplying the other information? Yep. Great, great, simple question. Um, here's my not so simple answer. <laughs> Is if, if you want to really establish yourself as, uh, you know, if you're serious about real estate investing and you're serious about wanting to develop relationships with your bankers, you know, this is what the professional real estate investors do, right? And and is they make me a presentation that goes all through all the C's that we just mentioned, okay? With the, with the, like, this is the deal. This is my personal financial statement. This is my tax returns, you know? And but ironically, the bigger deals that I underwrite they get done faster because these professional investors they're they're it's very organized and it's it's i don't have to dig i don't 
you know, it's, it's, so they get done faster than these little $30,000, $50,000 loans because then I have to go hunt around for information. They don't email in the right tax return. You know, everybody gets stuck in email hell and, you know, nobody likes <laughs> that, you know. So, uh, that's, um, so if you're serious, I mean, I, it doesn't take that much time at all to develop a presentation and, of all your tax returns, PFS, blah, 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 a little banker's book, and um, and take it around. Yeah. That's so so ulti- ultimately what you're doing is handing on a silver platter uh, all the information that the banker needs. And by doing that, if they're looking at you versus the other guy, that competitor that may not have wanted to share the banker with you, they're going to lose no matter what because, frankly, you're organized, you're showing your level of professionalism. You're actually, I think, by doing so, improving your character uh, by saying, hey, I'm a professional. I know what you guys need. I know what you want. Absolutely. And that's the, you know, that's the thing. With The reality is, is that, you know, bankers are, you know, it, going back to what we were saying earlier on the podcast about reversing this process and making it like a sales process, you're just making it easier because if you're dealing with a, a larger loan, right, for a larger apartment complex, they're going to have to take this to a loan committee, maybe the board of directors, and the, the loan officer is going to have to sell you, right, to, to me, the underwriter, the credit officer. And if you've just got a bunch of random tax returns and stuff, I'm like, ah, he's not, you know, he doesn't look serious. He doesn't look like yeah. he has his stuff together. And I don't want to loan money to people who don't have their stuff together, right? That is, that's a great That's tip. great. Actually, like, I, I just feel totally, like, uh, bad now. Like, I just handed my, you know, banker a few weeks ago, like, just a pile of stuff. And I'm Slam like, your head. <laughs> <laughs> right now brand no no i'm like man i'm so gonna change that right now i mean <laughs> if i could like summarize like what kind of this whole show has been about it's like if you just take a proactive approach to lending the way that we might make a proactive approach to our investing strategy yeah everything just works out better it's the same roadmap uh kind of uh what do you call that i was talking about a roadmap right you just plot things out ahead of time then you just follow your own map the same thing works for lending it sounds like yeah and no one thinks of it that way no, but, you know, I'll, I tell people to, like, you know, shoot the moon, go listen to publicly traded conference calls on publicly traded home builders or publicly traded apartment complex. You know, what do they talk about for half the conference call? Their financing strategy. You know, what, what are they going to use? Are they going to issue equity? Are they going to get more loans? What's their balance sheet looking like? So, you know, obviously they're serious. They're publicly traded. Like, you know, get if you're, you want to be a serious real estate investor, Treat it like that. Yeah, 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 that's awesome. No, that was that was incredible. Really, really great stuff. Um, we need to move on, and and with that, we are going to move to the. It's time for the fire round. Fire. fire. <laughs> All, right. <laughs> All right, the fire round. Thirty-year fixed mortgage or five-one arm, or let's just say, you know, I'll add to that any kind of. Uh, variable rate mortgage what are your thoughts on that uh from a pr- completely opposite depending on who you're asking the uh, me the uh real estate investor i go with the 30 year all day every day it's pretty much all my loans uh, as yeah. a lender i structure it a 5-1 a 3-1 if i can get away with it <laughs> so so it's a bank's interest to try to get the lowest possible you know term that's fixed and then go to variable but it's in our yeah. interest to go longest possible yeah Okay, and so somewhere in the middle probably is where possibly you're going to end up meeting if you negotiate of some kind. Yep, and speaking of negotiation, if you want to get negotiate a really low rate right now, just um, and you're okay with the risk, I mean, just uh, ask what the rate would be on a completely variable loan. Uh, I've had several hotel investors do this because you know they their LTV is at a great position. They're okay with the risk. They've got the cash, and they're just like, "Give me a completely variable rate. I don't, I'm fine with it." And they, and um, man, they've gotten some extraordinary deals. Interesting. Yeah, that's. I mean, it's risky, but it's it's uh, definitely risky. Yeah. It's a strategy, especially if you have the cash and you can handle the risk. That's great. Cool. Yep. Yeah. Right on. All right. So, uh, hmm, no money down. It's one of those uh, phrases that, that people like to pitch and sell as a, as a way to, to make things happen. So is, is there any way that you can see a no money down deal happening with, uh, with a traditional loan? No. 
Uh, I mean, it happens if you want to use collateral, like I was talking about other, like pledge an investment account, pledge, like cross collateralize it with another piece of property that you have paid off, something like that. But uh, a lot of the financing strategies that, you know, the gurus talk about and, and people ask about on the forums, you know, I know that they, they work and they're out there, but generally speaking, I mean, they... It's just you're looking for a needle in the haystack, and um, you know it's just I don't. For me personally, if if you've got a structure in place that can uh, work around that, it's it'd be best just to go with that first versus just trying to find no money down. Yeah, no, that, that, that's great. Uh, how about this then? Next question: Somebody outside of the U.S. can they still get a loan, a commercial loan? Are they still? Are you working with these people? These no. people. <laughs> uh, here's, here's, well, here's the reason, uh, here's the primary problem with that is they have foreign tax returns. And so that's real, that's impossible to underwrite for somebody like me who, you know, I don't deal with, even if Canadian tax returns, I mean, you need to deal with a com- Canadian bank cause they're, they know how to underwrite a Canadian, you know? Yeah. So, uh, that's the primary problem with that. Okay. All right, and there probably are some banks out there, somebody that does it. Oh, like absolutely, similar, like larger bank. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Okay, cool. Right on, right on. All right, so can somebody go and get a commercial loan on multiple single-family houses, or do they have to, because we're dealing with single-family houses, do they have to go through a traditional? Yeah, portfolio loans are, uh, it's really interesting. People talk about it in the Beaver Pockets Forum like it's this unicorn, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and it's really not... I mean, a big deal. I mean, I do them all. I underwrite and loan. You know, make them all the time. It's not that you have to have a proper presentation for your, you know, your lender, and you obviously have to have equity, and you know, it has to be a good position from a portfolio perspective. But they're not, they're not that hard to get for community banks and even okay. credit unions. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Okay. And I know there's there's a bunch of players who started to really jump into this space, particularly like Blackstone with their B2R finance and others who are uh, really targeting people specifically for these types of loans as well. Yeah. Yeah, and that's uh, that's going to be probably bigger in the future. As I, I think that's probably how lending is going because I know a lot of my friends that do that. They uh, put all their they have equity investors, and then they you know. Are, they put up all cash up front and then they get a portfolio and then they do a cash out to grow or to pay themselves back or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. I think things are definitely changing right now. It'll be kind of fascinating to see where it all ends up. Yeah. So, all right. Well, suddenly there's a lot of uh, interest in, in single family space, which, yep. you know, hasn't really had interest for a long time, but, uh, you know, there, there's, uh, the wolves are starting to come in. <laughs> so yeah. to speak. Well, cool. All right. Hey, let's move on to our final round of the show. This would be our famous four. What is your favorite real estate book? I don't, I've thought about this for a while and I'm actually going to uh, give one that's, it talks a little bit about real estate, but I don't think anybody's recommended it on the podcast before, but it's MJ DeMarco's uh, Fastlane book, Millionaire Fastlane. It sounds like a cheesy title, but uh he talks about building systems around real estate in the in the end part of the book, and it's it's like Tim Ferriss's Four Hour Work Week, but I think it, it's a it's just different. I like it more because it's more granular and it just gives more details about building systems for your business. Yeah, cool. Okay. I, I think I remember uh, he was over on I think Pat Flynn's podcast a while back. Yep. Yeah. So I've heard the name. I'll check that book out. Mm-hmm. Right on. Right on. All right. How about your favorite business book? What is it? Favorite business book. Uh, I'm going to go with 80, 80-20 sales and marketing. <laughs> but, you know, I'm big into like 80-20, you know, just uh, how to figure out like how to scale a business and things like that. So I'm all just, I'm completely focused on, you know, Pareto's principles. So I'll just go with that. Okay, cool. And, and I'll link nice. to those in the show notes also. So. All right. What about uh, hobbies? Any any uh, any type of things that you do for fun outside of real estate? Yeah, I'll, I actually like to hunt and fish and uh, do that here in the south. I uh, uh, like to ski in the winter, so that's nice. That's, nice. that's my hobbies. Yeah. Right on. You guys have skiing down there in 
Tell we, uh, we, we do, but it's a little embarrassing. So I usually actually, <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, I don't like to tell people. <laughs> uh, we have like 18 of your mountains and one of yeah. ours, right? Yeah. It's, it's pretty embarrassing, especially for you guys out West. But, uh, no, I'll, I'll like, I'm going a couple weeks out West. Uh, so yeah, that's cool. cool. Oh, nice. All right. Uh, last question of the famous four. What do you believe sets apart successful investors from those who are not? One word, organization. And so I would just, you know, again, like I was talking about the presentation and things like that. You know, if you want to just email in all your tax returns and whatever somebody's asking you, or you want to have like a, a comprehensive plan, presentation, book, whatever you want to call it, and then hand that out, I mean, you're at such a better advantage strategically uh, to negotiate, to get the loan you want. You know, it's just a, a better position to be in. Awesome. I love right. it. I love it. That is great. All right. Well, Jimmy, listen, man, it's been, uh, it's been a real pleasure. We definitely appreciate having you on the show. I want to thank you for taking the time. And where can people find out more about you? Yeah. Hit, hit me up on Bigger Pockets. I have a, like, negotiating guide i have linked in my bio for everybody and then i have a uh on my personal blog is real estate finance hq.com so cool. Cool. awesome awesome yeah. all right man well thank you so much for being on the show and we'll uh, we'll see you around thanks guys have a good one all right thank you all right everybody that was our show show 55 of the bigger pockets podcast you can check out the show notes at biggerpockets.com slash show 55 I uh, I don't know, man. I know I said it during the show a couple times, but uh, that was that was awesome. What do you think, Brandon? That was awesome. I, I learned probably like a thousand new things that I had no idea about. So uh, hopefully everyone else out there feels the same way. Yeah, and, and we all learned that you're quite disorganized. So <laughs> I'm <great>. so unorganized. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad I'm glad to know that. You know, I'm glad. Yeah, you know, it's been a, you've been working for me, and I'm just figuring that out. Yeah, I'm, I'm completely a mess. <laughs> <laughs> Ah oh, man, it's all good. No, that was great. That was great. Well, listen, hopefully you guys enjoyed the show. Again, I know I'm super proud that that we we crossed our million listen down, uh, um, million listen milestone. So thanks again for for those of you who who uh, are are regulars and and if you're new to the show, get back there and check out our previous 54 shows. There there there's something to learn in every single one of them. So definitely make sure to do that. Otherwise. Thanks for listening. Check us out on Facebook, facebook.com slash bigger pockets, Twitter, twitter.com slash bigger pockets. If you're not following us on those places, you know, if, if for nothing else, it's a great place to kind of keep up to date on, on new content that we're showing. But we also share news. If ever there's a problem with the site or anything else, you know, it, it's a good channel to turn to to find out about what's going on. Uh, otherwise, if you're not active on bigger pockets, get active on bigger pockets, jump in, get a profile created, and don't just sit there with an empty profile. Introduce yourself to the community, get involved, ask questions, help people out, connect, communicate with your peers, participate. Because what happens when you participate, Brandon? You make money. <laughs> it's pretty, well, I mean, I, I think that's, that's pretty fair. I mean, those people who are engaging, connecting, participating are, are, are getting to know their, their peers and their peers are getting to know them. It's, it's invaluable. So uh, do it. Get in there and make it happen. Uh, that's about it. That's all I got for you. Thank you so much for putting up with Brandon. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, you know, hopefully we'll, we'll see you for the next one. Are you not going to take us out? Okay, fine. I gave him the opportunity. He chose not to. <laughs> this is Josh Dorkin. Signing off. Barrett. You're listening to Bigger Pockets Radio, simplifying real estate for investors large and small. If you're here looking to learn about real estate investing without all the hype, you're in the right place. Go to join the millions of others who have benefited from BiggerPockets.com, your home for real estate investing online. Hey, 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 what's going on, everybody? This is Fat Joshua. We're the host of the Bigger Pockets podcast. <laughs> what? <laughs>